We'll take our reading from the Psalms and maybe a phrase or two from the Gospel. Psalm 121. I rejoiced at the things that were said to me. We shall go into the house of the Lord. Our feet were standing in thy courts, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which is built as a city, which is compact together. For thither did the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. Psalm 128. I will lift up my eyes and consider thy wonders, O Lord, that thou mayest teach me thy justices. Give me understanding, and I will learn thy commandments. And finally, we hear in the Gospel of Matthew, And behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good shall I do that I may have an everlasting life? If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. St. Teresa of Jesus said so well, In the company of saints we become saints. In the company of the saints... We become saints. Does not this pithy saying capture the theme of this mission? Nay, even the whole of our life. That is, this life is all about practicing for heaven, where we hope to live in the company of the saints forever. This life is all about claiming a place in heaven, an angelic choir stall in the celestial abode above. And this is determined by how we respond to the graces sent to us by God. This requires passing the test, the entrance exam to heaven, and this life is the exam. This life is all about becoming a saint, and that takes practice. Thus, St. Philip Neri said, The true servant of God acknowledges no other country but heaven. And he often added, The great thing is to become a saint. But how? We keep company with the saints, those in heaven and those striving for the same here on earth. As we stressed last night, heaven is a society. But this evening, let's reflect on what it takes to live in that society. In the company of saints, we find they read certain books and even memorize them, at least parts of them. Come to find out those books they read were written by saints. Thus, St. Philip Neri said we should always be about reading books whose authors' names starts with Yes, St. Augustine, St. Thomas, St. Bernard, St. Ignatius, St. Francis de Sales, St. Teresa. You want to be a saint? Then we have to read what saints wrote and even read them over and over again until they sink in and take notes until we get it. When heaven opened up to the prophets and later to St. John, scrolls were seen. The Psalm of David we heard at the start of this conference says, I rejoice at the things that were said to me. Scrolls, things are spoken. We rejoice at the things said, the things written. This is precisely what divine revelation is. Things of sacred scripture and sacred tradition and the authoritative teachings of the church. Holy Mother Church has indulged prayerful and meditative reading of the sacred scripture for a reason. The saints have recommended over and over again that we read and meditate upon the passion of his majesty. You just pick up the gospel, go to the passion, and start reading. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us this principle. The more noble the effect, the greater is precedence in the intention of the agent. The more noble the effect, the greater its precedence in the intention of the agent. What does this mean? 
The most noble effect possible in our life is to have a place in heaven, to possess God. That's the most noble effect we can do. To see him face to face in heaven, to be saved, to bring him glory by our salvation. We must draw closer to the most noble intentions of God, therefore, and make them our own. And we will surely experience this most noble effect of God in the everlasting life of heaven. In a word, we need to know what these most noble intentions of God are so that we can share in the effect. Or we might say, the closer we draw to the beginning of the ordering in God's intentions, or His intention, since God is simple, the more noble effects we produce for Him. Among the first things God intended, the Bible tells me, heaven. First thing mentioned in the Bible, the first thing he made, it says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Knowing heaven and all things about this primordial celestial home of angels and men is a most noble endeavor. Once again, we simply must draw closer to this noble intention of God and make it our own. And we will surely experience this most noble effect of God in the everlasting life of heaven, namely our salvation. Again, we conclude, we need to know these noble ideas, these noble intentions of God. But how? We have to be informed. We have to be told by heaven itself. St. Paul thus says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man what things God has prepared for them that love him. But to us, and here's the key, but to us who have faith, God hath revealed them by his spirit. No wonder King David exclaims, I rejoiced at the things that were said to me. Thus, with St. Augustine, we have to tole lege, tole lege. That's Latin for take up and read. It's a command. An angel spoke to the great father of the church. But when he was a sinner, he says, tole lege. And he took up and read the Bible. The letter of St. Paul to the Romans. And this is how this great saint, the greatest of the fathers, the doctor of grace, he converted from a life of impurity. How? He read the scriptures. We might note here how others at that very time when he was converting, in large numbers were converting with him after reading the life of St. Anthony of the Desert, written by St. Athanasius. There's a couple copies in the foyer, in the entryway. They were reading a book written by a saint. Who, by the way, St. Anthony converted and went out in the desert after hearing the gospel. He rejoiced at the things that were said to him and he went up and became a great saint. The greatest of the desert fathers. A Russian soldier comes to mind. At one point in his life, he nearly lost everything due to a serious drinking habit. No surprise there. He's Russian drinking habit. The soldier tried many different ways to break the habit. Nothing worked. He was truly a desperate case, as so many drunkards are. Finally, a monk advised him to read the Gospels, to read about heaven. Every time he was tempted to drink, he was to read one chapter of the Gospel, at least. If the temptation continued, he was to read another. Until the temptation passed. The man did not follow the advice at first. Rather, he put the Gospels in his trunk for storage until one day, and I'll let him tell the rest of the story. An irresistible desire for drink drove me hurriedly to open my trunk, to get some money and rush off to the public house. But the first thing my eyes fell on was a copy of the Gospels. And all that the monk had said to me came back vividly to my mind. I opened the book and began to read the first chapter of St. Matthew. I got to the end of it without understanding a word. Still, I remembered that the monk had said, no matter if you do not understand, 
go on reading diligently anyway. Come, I said to myself, I must read the second chapter. So I did and began to understand a little more. Soon, I started to read the third chapter, and then the barracks bell began to ring. Everyone had to go to bed. No one was allowed to go out, and I had to stay where I was. When I got up in the morning, I was just on the point of going out to get some wine, when I suddenly thought, supposing I were to read another chapter. What would be the result? I read it, and I did not go to the public house. Again, I felt the craving, and again I read a chapter. I felt a certain amount of relief. This encouraged me. From that time on, whenever I felt the need of drink, I used to read a chapter of the Gospels. What is more, as time went on, things got better and better. And by the time I had finished all four Gospels, my drunkenness was absolutely a thing of the past. And I felt nothing but disgust for this behavior. It was just 20 years now since I drank a drop of alcohol. Holy Mother Church encourages us to read the book of books, the sacred scriptures, the Bible. Here's what she says. A partial indulgence is granted to the faithful who with the veneration do the divine word make a spiritual reading from the sacred scripture. A plenary indulgence is granted if this reading is continued for at least one half an hour. Be sure to read the Douay Reims version. It is the safest and best English translation we have. Furthermore, let's obey the Council of Trent and not use the sacred word of God for jokes of any kind. For the fourth session of Trent says this, Wishing to repress that temerity by which the words and sentences of sacred scripture are turned and twisted to all sorts of profane uses, to wit, to things scurrilous, jokes, to things fabulous, to things vain. This synod commands and enjoins for the doing away with this kind of irreverence and contempt, and that no one may henceforth dare in any way to apply the words of sacred scripture to these and such like purposes. If you want it to work for you, you should respect it. This is the divine revelation. So we read, we study. This is what the saints did. If we want to be a saint, this is what we should do. In the company of saints, we find that they dress very modestly. Heaven always reveals them as wearing long robes. St. John says in the Apocalypse, white robes were given to every one of the heaven dwellers. Whenever they visit earth, they always appear fully covered, don't they? Hinting to us, this is what heaven is like. Sadly, so many in our times either want to be fashionable or just do the bare minimum. Looking around at the saints, this does not seem to be something they approved of or did. Now, this indicates that clothing matters to heaven. If you want to practice for heaven, what we wear is important. Now, what does this say about this whole idea bandied about in certain circles today? Naked without shame. I've heard that a number of times in my upbringing in religious life and the priesthood. Before the fall, however, we know that Adam and Eve were truly naked and without shame because they were clothed in the light of grace. They saw each other through that light. But 7,000 years of experience show that we must clothe ourselves lest sins of shame multiply and compound. Let us turn for a moment to the 13th century Dominican, St. Hyacinth. His feast day is August 17. During his time in Poland, we read about this particular miracle in the Roman breviary. He crossed over the river Vistula near Visograd when it was in flood, taking his companions with him, not by boat, but on his cloak spread out over the waters. Now notice, notice, it was a piece of clothing that belonged to him as a Dominican friar 
that God used to perform a miracle. The same was done by St. Raymond of Penafort and St. Francis of Paola, the wonder worker. They used their religious robes to go from the mainland. For Raymond, it was Barcelona, I believe. And for Francis of Paola, it was the Italian mainland. And they went to islands. Paola went to Sicily. They used their religious robes to go from the mainland to the island. Like a boat. Again, this means our clothing is important. And using a holy cloak to get across a body of water is not insignificant. The water represents the trials of this life, the flooding river, the vistula, the ocean. It represents the trials of this life, while getting to the other side represents reaching heaven or the promised land. And it was their clothing, you get it? It was their clothing that made the crossing possible. Think of the Israelites passing over the flooding river Jordan so long ago in order to get to the promised land. It was the flooding river that represents this world. They're going to the promised land. By the way, the Ark of the Covenant that made the Jordan stop was wrapped up in three layers. It was, so to speak, modestly dressed. Now, what is more, many saints received garments from heaven while they lived on earth. St. Teresa of Jesus received a garment from St. Joseph, today's saint. St. Lydwin, she received a veil from Our Lady in heaven. St. Ildefons of Toledo, a chasuble, as many medieval artists depict. Again, the message here seems to be that heaven is interested truly and really in what we wear, and that our clothing has a part to play in our getting to that celestial abode. Clothing has long been considered a first line of defense against the elements of the world. This is true in the spiritual realm as well. The 19th century Carmelite mystic, Saint Mary of Jesus Crucified, known as the Little Arab, was once mysteriously possessed. She was possessed by the devil for 40 days. And during this time, an exorcist was praying over her. And the habit of the saint was pushed up such that her legs were exposed. The devil went wild, screaming, cover the little Arab, cover the little Arab. The master has forbidden us to do anything against modesty because she has never sinned on this point. She was just showing part of her legs. What's the big deal? The devil knew it was a big deal. Consider the following exchange between Our Lady and St. Gemma of Golgani. St. Gemma of Golgani, Our Lady, Jesus, my son, loves you very much, and he wants to give you a grace. The stigmata, in other words, is what she was talking about. Do you know how to make yourself worthy of this grace? St. Gemma writes, In my misery, I did not know what to answer. She continued, I will be your mother. I will be, and you will be, a true daughter, she asks. She spread her mantle and covered me with her mantle. Her mantle saves, in other words. It brings us across the flooding revolutionary river of this world, an article of clothing. Again, we see that clothing is important. What we wear matters. When I was given my religious habit, the Roman cassock, the formula read, May you be clothed with Mary Immaculate. It makes you want to wear your habit always, and so I do. When out and about people ask, why do you wear black and long robe? I say, because someone special died, and I do not want to forget that. That's why it's black. And now I'm going to add, I think, because I am practicing for heaven. Where they wear long robes. In reflecting on God's created order, Aristotle gave gave us ten categories that help us define things. That is, they enable us to understand their place and meaning in creation. We're able to define them. Some examples, using simple language, they include things like color, shape, place, size. But last among them, of these ten categories, is habit. 
In other words, what one is wearing. Yes, what we have on our bodies helps to define who we are. Think of a police officer. We know when a man is dressed in a certain uniform, having a badge and other like things, he is there to defend the public order. It defines something about him. When things get tight, it's comforting to see one of those good men about dressed for the job. You know who to go to. The gospel describes St. John the Baptist according to what he wore and what he ate. And John was clothed with camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Recall that in the miracle of the sun, Our Lady appeared wearing different clothing. For example, she came dressed as Our Lady of Mount Carmel and, and also as Our Lady of Sorrows. Each of these defining a certain element of the Fatima message. It's one of the first questions people ask the visionaries. Well, how did she look? What did she look like? What was she wearing? She wore a blue girdle and she had golden roses on her feet. What we wear is important. It's something that can help us to get to heaven or hinder us from going there. Speaking of our times to Venerable Mother Mariana of Jesus Torres, she's the one who saw Our Lady of Good Success. The same lady prophesied in those times, the 20th century and beyond. The atmosphere will be saturated with the spirit of impurity, which like a filthy sea will engulf the streets and public places with incredible license. Innocence will scarcely be found in children or modesty in women. He who should speak seasonably will remain silent. Words from heaven. Many want us to stop mentioning or pushing this matter even now. Oh, they're so radical. Always pushing that issue. St. Paul says, the works of the flesh are manifest. And among them he lists immodesty. But then he says, the fruit of the Spirit is charity. And he goes on and he lists modesty. Works of the flesh, immodesty. Works of God and the Spirit, modesty. Continency, chastity. He says, those who give way to the works of the flesh, quote, shall not obtain the kingdom of heaven. End quote. Pope Pius XII says, and here's a modern. He was living in the middle of the 20th century. We can't say, oh, he's old fashioned. He says, God does not require us to ignore the dictates of fashion so that we look grotesque. But fashion can never be the supreme rule of conduct. There is a limit beyond which fashion can bring about the ruin of a soul. He goes on. The good of the soul is more important than that of the body. And we must prefer the spiritual well-being of our neighbor to that of our own bodily comfort. If a certain type of clothing constitutes a grave or approximate occasion of sin and puts in danger the salvation of your soul and that of others, it is your duty to stop wearing it. Clothing matters to heaven. Let's practice for heaven by wearing clothing fitting to our station in life. Modest clothing will get us across the flooding revolutionary river of this life. Make no mistake. It will help. In the company of the saints, we find they always speak well and without fear of human respect. They always seem to say the right thing at the right time in the right manner, not complaining or blaming anyone for their problems. Job on his dung heap did not blame the Sabaeans or even the devil. He knew all was allowed or sent by God. If you want to be a saint, we need to strive to control our tongues. All we need to do, all what we need to do, the saints did. Suffer well and often in silence. 
Believe me, I know it's hard. I'm quite the talker. And see, we need to see then all is coming from the hand of God. I once visited a Dominican house of friars where they placed a picture of St. Dominic at the entrance to the cloistered area. And he looks right at you when you come in and his finger is on his lips. Telling those who enter to be quiet and to use care when speaking. From the very beginning of man's existence, the tongue that is man's faculty of speech has played no small role in salvation history. Starting in the Garden of Eden, we find that the fall of man took place through dialogue, through speech. First, the serpent convinced Eve vocally to partake of the forbidden fruit. In turn, Eve talked Adam into doing the same. Thus we read, And to Adam God said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife. Then he punished him. Everyone knows well that man is prone to causing problems with his tongue. In the desert, Miriam and Aaron started a little revolt against Moses as they made their pilgrimage to the promised land. God became angry with them when they vocalized their claims against Moses. Later on, spreading the discouraging reports led the Lord to make the people wander in the desert for 40 years. It was caused by the tongue. Forty years of desert travel. Everyone died except two because of that tongue. Forcing them there to die. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, How long doth this wicked multitude murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. And communities such as extended families and parishes, places of employment, neighborhoods and towns, irresponsible use of the tongue is often more harmful than not. I have heard the harm called triangulation, strangulation. What is that? This is what happened to Moses. First comes triangulation, and then its effect is strangulation, a cutting off, an amputation, an excluding someone from people's hearts, minds, and lives. First comes triangulation, and it works like this. Think of a pie cut up into normal pieces, such as you have a number of wedges or triangles. They all have a common point at the meeting in the center. The person occupying the center is the person under scrutiny, the one being discussed, the one being talked about. It is Moses. Where the pieces meet out at the circumference make other points, Namely, those who are concerned, those doing the scrutinizing, those holding the suspicion. It starts with one or more people on the outside, namely Miriam and Aaron, having some problem with Moses in the middle. Some grave concern, and maybe it's legitimate, but they approach each other. Instead of taking the problem straight to Moses or an authorized person, remember they had a hierarchy of judges already in place by then. They could approach them and ask, can you approach Moses on this? They turned to each other instead and they talked about their problem. So a triangle is formed. Miriam is upset with Moses and goes to Aaron and expresses her concern. Aaron starts to see Miriam's problem as his own. So Aaron soon becomes upset with Moses too. Now we have one triangle, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. As you can imagine, Aaron is probably not content to just sit on this problem either, but turns to another. And the whole process repeats and continues until another triangle is formed. And so on until it comes back around to Miriam again. And the circling effect then is the strangulation. Moses is alone in the middle of the people against him. And he realizes, I am alone. Everyone is against me. I hope this sounds familiar. I know I've been in the middle at least once or twice in my life. And I'm sure I've been on the outside too. I make no denial. Consider another example from the life of St. Teresa. After experiencing her second conversion, after 20 years of prayer, 20 years of lukewarm life, She prayed and prayed that she could break free of it. This was in the 16th century Avila convent, the Incarnation. After having an amazing conversion, 
caused uneasiness in those around her. The wise virgins did not yet consider her as one of themselves. And the foolish virgins, the foolish virgins were exasperated to find that the very person whose frivolities justified their own was now repenting. Such repentance was tantamount to an accusation of them all. When they saw her, they began to whisper together. Soon many of them pointed the finger of scorn at Teresa. And eventually the whole convent was seething, either with sarcasm or pity. Doña Teresa thinks herself a saint. Doña Teresa thinks she's invented something new. Doña Teresa thinks she's special. She endured this, the first of many efforts at strangulation, of amputation. This triangulation can happen very quickly in a tightly knit community, such as a family. Aaron, Miriam, and Moses were brothers and sister. Or it can happen very quickly in a parish or a neighborhood. Think of how Facebook and other social media make forming triangles very quick and easy. It's epidemic, even pandemic now. In heaven, it is very different. In that celestial abode, we will only see and talk to each other by looking at God and the center of heaven. To practice now then for heaven, we need to strive to see the difficult person through God and who is in the center. And our attitude toward them will surely change. He, that is God, will help us filter out all the lies. Many a saint looked upon those causing them trouble as being from the hand of God himself. As being sent by God or allowed by God. Instead of getting all mad at Moses, you can't get mad so easily at God if you love him. Conversions always follow. St. Maria Goretti. To stop this strangulation, strangulation, we have the model of the saints in the hierarchy on earth. That is, we have superiors established in authority to whom we can turn when we have some troubles. There is a hierarchy. We have to be willing to be led. Furthermore, the gospel tells us commands us to approach the person in the center directly. Most of us are afraid to do it. If the people had gone straight to Moses to complain, the problem could have been solved. Instead, they chose to spread discouraging reports and conspire against the Lord's anointed. And they were severely punished. And Miriam got leprosy. In the gospel, unlike the Pharisees, Nicodemus went straight to our Lord. He was counted among those who helped Our Lady to bury their Lord properly. He had problems with him. He went straight to him. The woman laboring under an unsolved case went straight to the unjust judge until she received a judgment. Maybe it wasn't even in her favor, but she went straight to the source and dealt with it. There are many such examples of success. St. Abba Dorotheus, he admonishes us strongly. He's a desert father. He says, I am always repeating to you that from insignificant self-indulgences, we come to important sins, grave sins. What is more grievous than the sin of condemning one's neighbor? What else is so hateful and alienating to God? And yet man comes to this great evil through something seemingly unimportant from allowing himself a small censure of his neighbor. For when this is allowed, the mind begins to leave its own sins without attention and notice the sins of its neighbor. And this leads to gossip, reproaches, speaking evil, and finally pernicious condemnation. Yet nothing angers God more, nothing so despoils a man of grace and leads so surely to perdition as fault-finding, speaking evil, and condemning one's neighbor. Abba Dorotheus. Let's strive mightily to avoid getting involved with harmful triangulation, strangulation. Recognize it when it's happening. Break free of it and say, have you talked to this person? Let's go see him. 
So here's some steps we should take. Seek out the person themselves with whom we have an issue. Face-to-face is always best. Avoiding electronic media and further misunderstandings that will result from using that form. Number two, respectfully approach and express our concerns to those constituted in authority over us with all that filial piety demands. Use the chain of command. If you've exhausted one, you go to the next. Notice the words I use. When you have exhausted one, you don't jump to the highest. You go up in a ladder form. Three, not forget. Let us not forget our own sins and sinfulness, thereby helping us to hesitate to make a triangle at all. He who points the finger of another has three pointing back at himself. Are we so sure we're ready to make the complaint? Are we so perfect that we know all the answers? Are we sure we haven't seen something? Number four, strive to speak more of things and events rather than persons and personalities, using general terms as much as possible. And most importantly, number five, see the person under question through God. Practicing for heaven as if we're already there. Look at them through the filter of God as the saints see each other in heaven. He is truly our filter of truth and love. St. James gets the last or the final word here. He says, dearly beloved, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If any man think himself to be religious, not bridling his tongue, but deceiving his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Let's practice for heaven. Let's control this unwieldy device. In the company of saints, we find they do difficult and arduous things, things that are not popular. That's why they're saints. They rarely, if ever, approve of mitigations but rather always try to restore the original disciplines. That's why saints are always at the head of restorations, like Teresa of Jesus and John of the Cross and St. Bernard and all these saints. They always strive to take the higher path, ever focusing on the peak, the summit of union and, and perfection with God, who is perfect love. Thus, not even death, however painful, seemed to hinder them. You want to be a saint? We should strive not to excuse ourselves from difficult works and mortifications, but to embrace them, ever seeking to please God and be numbered among his chosen ones. Here's some simple examples. Here we go. In heaven, they don't eat. They don't eat in heaven, but rather feast on God. Thus, we are to fast in this life, to train for heaven. Fasting is practicing for heaven. Fasting is playing heaven. By fighting a battle of the belly, the resurrection takes a deeper hold on our hearts. This opens the heart to receive the heavenly food of light and grace. God gave us a number of saintly examples to put us on display. Victim souls who could eat nothing but the Eucharist. Showing us that we are going to be, as it were, like that in heaven, eating only of the tree of life, feeding on God. No other food would stay down for them or do them any good. Also, consider listening to good reading when eating or listening to good sermons or conferences. Thus, St. Augustine advises his followers to feed the soul as they feed the body. Let not your mouths alone take nourishment, he said, but let your hearts to hunger for the word of God. So we fast. Maybe we can't fast much, but we should fast. Number two, in heaven, they do not sleep. Thus, we get up at a reasonable time while getting rid of snooze alarms. St. Philip Neri said there's no place in heaven for sluggards. In heaven, they are humble. Number three, they are given a place in heaven and they take that place. They know themselves even as they are known by God, which is part of humility. Thus, they cast down their crowns before the throne of God. Let's practice now. Let's be humble. In heaven, they forgive. Number four, as we've discussed, 
They forgive. There's no room for unforgiveness in heaven. Number five, in heaven, they love the truth and hate heresy, as we also have discussed. They never tire of learning about God, whom they see face to face. These are arduous to do at times, to perform, but they're a part of our training. A few things more. In the company of saints, we find they made history. They acted as God's instruments at crucial moments down through time. Moments where many fell back afraid to do that difficult thing, to take that stand for truth, for goodness and right, and ran off and tried to hide in a cave. In a word, authentic history is about saints or the lack of saints. Recently, I read the lives of St. Francis Paola and St. Vincent Ferrer. It is striking how both of these men played pivotal, pivotal roles in helping kings and queens and many other leaders change for the better, thereby affecting whole nations and many future events. Look behind the world wars, World War I and World War II, and you will find that the saints were prevented from acting. And surely that is why the wars became so destructive and worldwide. They were atheistic. St. Pius X is said to have died of sorrow over the coming of World War I. The leaders refused to turn to him to resolve the issues at hand. And he was died of sorrow over this. It could have been prevented, and he knew it. But they were unwilling. Want to be a saint? Be not afraid to stand fast in doing good and defending the rights of the church. You will not be alone. Saints are present. They have been known even to come out of the skies, out of the heavens to help. We have many examples. Heavenly armies appearing out of nowhere to help the Maccabees and the Crusaders later. Saints Peter and St. Paul rescued from prison cells by angels. St. Lucy becoming immobile. St. Agatha being cured in prison of her wounds by St. Peter. Saints made history. In the company of saints, we find that they pray well and often, even all the time, as St. Paul instructs us to do. Everything became a prayer to the saints. They would not start anything without praying for divine assistance. They would negotiate with God at the altar before beginning any good work. Put a bookmark there. We're going to talk about that. They would never quit anything without thanking God for his graces. They would not do anything that could not be offered up to God as a prayer. That could not be put on the patent at the Mass. They practiced recollection and were constantly aware of God's presence as if they were already in heaven. They made every effort to renew communication with Him at special moments of the day and making morning prayers and night prayers and the Angelus three times, daily meditations and praying the Holy Rosary. Saints, pray. Heaven is one long sigh of prayer of love. If we want to be a saint, we got to pray too. Heaven is one long prayer. St. Philip Neri said, Let us then learn here below to give God the confession of praise, which we ought to hope to give Him in heaven above. Thus, attending Sunday Mass, that's a sign you want to go to heaven. You forego Sunday Mass to sign you don't care. I don't care about heaven. You want to go to heaven, you go to Mass. If you don't want to go to heaven, you don't go to Mass. You want to practice for hell? Skip out. And that's what it means to go to Mass on Sunday. Or any other day, you can add on there to make sure that you fulfill your obligations. When you go beyond the requirement, it's easy to fulfill the requirement. In the company of saints, we find that they are obedient They're fixed in God. Listen to St. Catherine of Genoa. She says, The faithful departed soul for its parts no longer has a choice of its own. It can seek only what God wills, nor would it want it otherwise. 
That would be a self-seeking act that would distract that soul from the contemplation of the divine will. And that distraction, listen to our words, that distraction in itself would be a hell. Wow. In another place, the same saint says, the souls in purgatory dwell rather on the resistance they feel in themselves against the will of God, against his intense and pure love, bent on nothing but drawing them up to him. The most painful thing for a soul in purgatory is that his will is not united with God's. Do we feel this way about our faults, about our self-love, our self-indulgence? St. Catherine points out over and over that the souls in purgatory feel great joy in one thing, that they are now finally doing the will of God. What he wills for them is what gives them joy, she says. We can practice fixing our wills in God by adhering completely to the disciplines, to the teachings first and foremost, but also to the disciplines of the church and all her traditional disciplines, as well as obeying the legitimate commands and directives of our superiors. Let us not forget that. Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden with only one act of disobedience. Let's not forget There was only one act of disobedience that kept the great Moses from entering the promised land until his majesty came and called him to join him on the mountain of Tabor. An important one more element of practicing for heaven in the company of saints is that we find they're chaste, they're virginal. In St. Matthew's Gospel, we read how in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like angels in heaven. That's everyone in heaven. The angels do not marry, but live in one family with all the saints, with God as their father and Mary as their mother. Now, this is best realized by the religious life, which is the heavenly life. Remember, religious are supposed to be playing heaven in their monasteries, where each member takes a vow of perfect chastity. Can we not see why the priest, who is to be a heavenly man, must be celibate, contrary to these modern ideas? Yet all who live chastely according to their states in life ought to have heaven in mind. For married couples, their chastity is found, their heavenly chastity, their heaven-aimed chastity, is found, how? In making saints for God, in cooperating with God, in making souls, in making new souls, new humans, saints for heaven, potential saints. That's their job. Thus, every time they come together, this ought to be what they have in their minds if they want to be, have, that is, heavenly chastity. In order to practice for heaven, that's got to be in your mind. That's got to be part of it. Living chastely is practicing for heaven. Living impurely is practicing for hell. St. Thomas Aquinas points out that most men overcome impurity by looking up to heaven. Quote, certain persons refrain from lustful pleasures chiefly through hope of the glory to come. End quote. In keeping his focus in heaven or on heaven, the saint knows that although something may feel good here for a time on earth, what some call an ecstasy, it is always fleeting and unsatisfying and not everlasting as is the ecstasy of heavenly bliss. You want to forego the eternal, everlasting ecstasy for some temporal one? Really? St. John of the Cross gives a heavenly way out of many sins, most especially those of unchastity. He calls this way out anagogical acts of love. That is, acts of love aimed at the end. Here is his instruction. There are two ways of resisting vices and acquiring virtues. The one is common and less perfect which is when you endeavor to resist some vice, sin, or temptation by means of the acts of virtue which conflict with this vice, which are the opposite of this vice, sin, or temptation. And you seek to destroy it with the practicing of that virtue. 
If, for example, I am conscious of the vice or temptation of impatience or the spirit of vengeance in my soul because of some harm which I have received or some insulting words, I then resist it by means of some good meditation. Notice he says you're going to need to meditate if you're going to overcome something. All of us are going to have to do this. Meditate upon the passion. Such that he says, you meditate upon the passion of the Lord or by means of meditation upon the blessings which are required by suffering, the Beatitudes, or by thinking that God commanded that we should suffer since suffering brings us profit. Take up your cross and follow me. By means of such meditations, I am moved to suffer, accept and desire such insults, affronts or evils as this to the glory and honor of God. Now this manner of resisting, he says, this manner of fighting such temptation, vice, or sin begets the virtue of patience by which we possess our souls. And it is a good method of resistance, though difficult and less perfect. Another way, he says, of conquering vices and temptations and acquiring and gaining virtue, which is easier and more profitable and more perfect. How? Here it is. By loving anagogical movements and acts alone. Anagogical, that's a big fancy word. It just means to the end. You go to the very end, you're done, you're finished. You don't need any exercise whatsoever, says St. John. The soul resists and destroys all the temptations of the adversary and attains virtues in the most perfect degree. So when we feel, and here's how to do it, he says, so when we feel the first movement or attack of any vice, such as lust, wrath, impatience, or a vengeful spirit, when some wrong has been done to us, we should not resist it by making an act of contrary virtue in the way that has been described above. But as soon as we're conscious of it, we should meet it with an act or a movement of anagogical love directed against this vice and should raise our affections to union with God. For by this means, the soul absents itself from its surroundings and is present with its God and becomes united with him. And then the vice or the temptation and the enemy are defrauded of their intent and have nowhere to strike. What he's saying is this, when you feel that temptation, that sin, that vice, you go straight to heaven and you put yourself before God and you start to think about what it would be like to be before God right now. And your body is dead and buried in the grave. What are you going to think about? What do you want to say to God? This is what he is saying to do. For the soul, he says, being where it loves you love heaven, you love God, rather than where it lives, has met the temptation with divine aid, and the enemy has found nowhere to strike and nothing whereon to lay hold. For the soul is no longer where the temptation or enemy would have struck or wounded it. And then, he says, oh, marvelous thing. The soul, having forgotten this movement of vice and being united and made one with its beloved, no longer feels any movement of the vice, wherewith the devil desired to tempt it and was succeeding in doing so. In the first place, because, as has been said, it has escaped. It's no longer present. So that if it may be put this way, St. John says, the devil is practicing temptation on a dead body. doing battle with something that is not alive, feels not, and is for the time being incapable of any temptation. Wow. In this way, there is begotten in the soul a wondrous and heroic virtue, a perfection which, which takes from it all concern about being praised or exalted or insulted or humbled or about whether men speak well of it or ill. Their truest effect upon the soul is to make it forget all things other than its beloved God. Wow. Don't you see what he's doing? Placing ourselves in heaven kills the vice of lust. Let us not forget the admonition of Our Lady of Fatima to Jacinta. More souls go to hell because of the sins of the flesh than any other reason. 
Pope Pius XI said, if the purity of Thomas Aquinas had failed in the extreme peril into which it had fallen, it is very probable that the church would never have had her angelic doctor. It is chastity that has given us great gifts throughout history. St. Vincent de Paul said this, Christ allowed himself to be falsely accused of the most appalling charges, allowing his wish to be overwhelmed with disgrace. Yet he loathed unchastity so much that we never read of his having been in even the slightest way suspected of it, much less accused of it, even by his most determined opponents. Let us love chastity. It's the heavenly virtue. Heaven is the home of the chaste and of the pure of heart, of mind and body. Now, there are many more things we could reflect upon, but we're out of time. But I think you see the point. Heaven is not something easy to attain, but rather, as His Majesty told us, it must be taken by violence. Doing violence to ourselves. Not later, but now. What is more, we have no excuses. We have right here in this church, in this parish, everything that the saints had. Let us embrace them with our whole heart so as to pass the entrance exam of heaven and enter into the company of the saints forever. Now, as is my custom, let's briefly review what we've learned tonight. We need help in making it to heaven. We need the saints even to be, as it were, already in their company in heaven. They will help us live rightly, virtuously. They will help us hate sin and error by looking up and starting always in heaven, working backwards to this life to do the right thing. Thus, we will study to know God. We will study to love God and serve God in this life, whom we will see face to face in the next by reading good books, by dressing modestly at all times, by speaking well to God in prayer and adoration, as well as using our tongues for the good of our neighbor, in fasting and not being sluggards, by humbly taking our place in the ordering established by God, ever seeking to obey our superiors in all things that are not sinful, while chastely awaiting the ecstasy of heaven. All this is done to be God's instrument in working his marvels at this moment in time, helping him make history for his greater honor and glory. Thank you for listening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Take for our reading from the Psalms and from 1 Corinthians. One thing I have asked of the Lord, this will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may see the delight of the Lord and may visit his temple. Psalm 26, Psalm 122. As the eyes of servants are on the hands of their masters, so are our eyes unto the Lord our God until he have mercy on us. And finally, 1 Corinthians. Eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man what things God hath prepared for them that love him. But to us, God hath revealed them by his Spirit. To practice for something, we must have something proportional to the end itself. If we're going to run a race, the end is to get a gold medal, we have to have a track in which we run the same race over and over again to get good at it. We have to have something proportional to the end itself, to the final race, to the final victory. We cannot practice without proper ideas, proper actions, and proper equipment. Actions that will be present in the final event. We need heaven here, in other words, if we're going to practice for heaven. And we have it available in the Mass, opening doors at the consecration as many works of art put on display. At Mass, heaven is opened up to us. 
We also have it in the descriptions of divine revelation, the book of the Apocalypse, the prophet Isaiah, the book of Daniel. We can indeed look up and see God in the Holy Mass and in the scriptures. We can enter into his courts. Here then is an important part of practicing for heaven, knowing that there is an up and there is a down and we can make a connection. We talked about heaven being a society. We've talked about how to live as it were we were in heaven tonight and a little bit tomorrow. We need to talk about making a connection to heaven. How is it we are going to connect to heaven? Often when young people finally come to themselves, waking up to the goodness of God and the need for deeper conversion, they start looking up lots, thinking about heavenly things and perhaps a vocation to the priesthood or religious life as this is the clear path upward. Inevitably, some worldling will advise them to travel the world first and to see things. Maybe you need to calm down, just travel the world and go have fun for a while, they were told. This is an old tradition, actually, going back to the 16th and 17th century England, with more and more of the people coming to wealth in that country. It was considered part of their education to experience other places and to see the sights of Europe and ancient Rome. But it seems to me, taking this advice is often nothing but a big distraction. And here's why. Eye of man, what have you not seen? The splendor of the noonday sun, the glory of the firmament resplendent with lights, sweet and touching majesty of the night, the rich productions of nature embellished by prodigies of art, treasures and splendors of the masters of the world. But you have not seen the palace of the King of Kings, that new land and those new heavens, heritage of the holy race, these marvels which the Son of Justice will alone brighten, that beautiful day of eternity that knows no setting or dimming. I of man, you have seen nothing. Travel the world, go ahead. You've seen nothing. Ear of man, ear of man, what have you heard? Accents of melody and harmony, singing and harmonious recitals inspired by genius, the sublime animation of an eloquence inflamed with the love of country and of religion, even oracles of divine wisdom made intelligible to weak mortals. But you have not heard the celestial concerts of the eternal festival, the unending raptures of the angels celebrating the thrice holy God, the communications of the word of God revealing to his elect without reserve, without end, the glory of God's essence. Oh, ear of man, you've heard nothing. Heart of man, what sweet things have you not felt? Delightful effusions of friendship, holy emotions of filial piety and maternal love, the mutual warmth of a keen and innocent tenderness, raptures of fervor inflamed by a sacred fire. But you have not felt the inexpressible seizure of a predestined soul that is forever united to the principle of its being, who is God. It's wonderment, it's joy, and that insatiable thirst joined to a perfect satisfaction when it embraces all at once the riches of God himself. Heart of man, you have felt nothing. It's are words from my founder in his preaching in France, and all how right he was. I have traveled a number of times, and my experience has been time and time again, three things. First, you're often tired and rushed to see as much as possible. After all, trips cost a lot of money, and you want to get your money's worth. Number two, you often suffer from information overload, making it hard to appreciate all the wonderful and historical things you're seeing. There's the Colosseum where all the martyrs died. Boy, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't even know what you're seeing half the time. There's so much stuff. Third of all, one has to do a lot of research ahead of time to get the most out of the places visited. But you, but having said that, there are two things that usually remain with me. Seeing the incorrupt bodies of the saints. 
It's worth the trip to see them. And to see and visit the soaring basilicas and cathedrals of the West. These can be very uplifting. The saints are in heaven, but for some, even their bodies, like that of Bernadette Siberu, our beloved Saint Bernadette, are already participating in that place, refusing to give way to the corruption of the world. I find myself literally often melting in their presence, in admiration and in love. Similarly, the soaring architectural works of art lift the mind and the heart up to heaven. The golden ceiling of the Lateran Basilica comes to mind. The dome of St. Peter's. But in the long run, even with all my travels, my faith tells me we have seen and heard nothing. Is this not one reason why they put gargoyles on some of the basilicas and soaring cathedrals of Europe? And in those gargoyles are laughing at our feeble attempts to bring heaven down to earth. They are saying, we've seen nothing. In a word, there is a hole in man's heart that needs to be filled. And this hole can only be filled by heaven's grace and heaven's matchless beauty. It can only be filled by God. Thus, St. Augustine famously said, Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. Until they rest in heaven. Now this means we need a spirituality. Something that connects us spiritually with the end. And if the spirituality is to fill that hole, it must be heavenly. If it is to help us get to heaven, it must come from heaven. It must be proportional to heaven. It must involve heaven. It's that simple. Thus King David said in the Psalms, One thing I have asked of the Lord, for this I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may see the delight of the Lord and may visit His temple. Recall for a moment how many elements of authentic Catholic spirituality came down from heaven to aid our piety out down through the centuries, to supply us with a spirituality that is safe and effective. The rosary was given to us by Our Lady to St. Dominic. The brown scapular was given to St. Simon Stock. The prayers we have, many of us have memorized are from heaven. The Fatima prayers. The golden arrow come to mind. The Hail Mary. These are heavenly prayers. St. Teresa of Jesus, the great mystical doctor, was given revelations about the nature of the spiritual life. That's why she's our mystical doctor. She discussed these in her works, most notably in her magnum opus, The Interior Castle. Once she fell asleep, writing a chapter in this book, only to wake up with it finished. You get it? Heaven finished it for her. St. John of the Cross was given many lights in his prison cell, helping him to formulate the poems upon which his spiritual theology is based. He was enlightened by grace, a heavenly light. It is held that St. Ignatius received his spiritual exercises from heaven. St. Pacomius, one of the fathers of monasticism, was given his monastic rule by angels. Heaven gives us the spirituality needed to practice for the celestial abode. Did not God reveal to Moses the spirituality he wanted his people to practice in the desert? This Exodus spirituality is typological and it still applies today. In other words, it's a type. Everything counts in the Exodus story, in other words. And it's not over. To name a few essential elements, the Israelites could only be saved from the destroying angel by having the blood of the Passover placed on their doorposts. Having survived the 10th plague, these chosen ones then passed over the Red Sea to begin the long journey to the promised land by constructing the tabernacle and eating the manna, drinking from the rock and obeying Moses and so on. We are now marked with the blood of Christ in baptism. And the way opens up to us through baptism to the promised land of heaven above by entering into the church militant 
And we have the ark in Our Lady, the manna in the Eucharist, and we have Moses in the Pope and the priesthood. It's still very relevant. But let's pause here and recall, and this is important. Let's pause and recall a few things that happened when Moses was leading the people and some things that happened after his time. That is, in recounting of the Exodus, we find a number of valuable lessons from those trying to enter either the Holy of Holies in the temple, the tent, or trying to enter the promised land without using the spirituality provided by God on the mountain. These people thought they didn't need these connecting devices. They didn't need this heavenly equipment. I can make it to heaven without it. In the book of Leviticus, we read how the priest sons of Aaron did not light the fire as they were supposed to, the fire of their censers from the altar of sacrifice before going into the holy. Quote, offering before the Lord strange fire, which was not commanded them, fire coming out from the Lord destroyed them and they died before the Lord, end quote. Now God was showing you committed mortal sins and they died to show that. Their fire was not marked with the blood of the sacrifice of Christ prefigured in this altar. They died because they did not keep to what heaven had given them. The great Russian novelist Dostoevsky called revolution fire in the minds of men. Oh, how many have this strange revolutionary fire in their minds, fire that brings death because it's not from heaven. It is error, it is heresy, it is rebellion from their established order. It is novelty. Sad to say, many try to baptize these ways and end up dying in fire for all eternity to make reparation for that strange fire. Tradition keeps us sane. Let us keep to what heaven has sent us. Number two. As they processed to the promised land, various rebellions took place against Moses and Aaron, a questioning of their anointing, thinking that they too could prophesy or conduct a pleasing liturgy before God without Moses and Aaron. We don't need those guys. They were all punished. Miriam was struck with leprosy for questioning Moses. The Levite sons of Kor thought they could administer just as good as Aaron. Dathan and Abiram likewise thought they could make it to heaven without the hierarchy established by God on the mountain through Moses. And you should know the story. The ground opened up and took these groups of people down to hell alive. Still kicking. Let us keep to what heaven has established Heaven has given us a spirituality. It is not to be toyed with. Then there were those attempting to go up to the promised land without the tabernacle in Moses. You can read about them. Like the devil on the first day, they wanted to reach out and take the promised land on their own strength. We don't need Moses. We don't need the tent. And they were killed. They didn't make it. How many today have stolen our baptism only to make it across the Red Sea, but have not the ability to traverse the desert, having rejected the tabernacle? Read here, the church militant. They have rejected this liturgy. Read here, the Mass. They have rejected the true manna. Read here, the Eucharist. They've rejected the leader. Read here, the Pope. And they've rejected the Ark. Read here, the Blessed Mother. Does that sound familiar? We don't need no church. We don't need no pope. We don't need no mass. And we don't need no ark, blessed mother, or the Eucharist either. There it is. How can they make it? They too will be consumed by fire. They are rejecting the spirituality revealed by heaven. Do you expect heaven to honor them for this? Number four. A little later, in the time of King David, the man Uzzah, he touched the ark. You remember the story? When they came to the floor of Nacon, it says, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen kicked and made it lean aside. And the indignation of the Lord was enkindled against Uzzah and he struck him for his rashness and he died on the spot there before the ark of God. What's going on here? He was trying to do a good thing. 
But these sacred items could not be touched except by those God had designated and appointed certain Levites using poles. They were not to touch the ark. It had to be carried with poles carefully, carefully wrapped with three layers. It was not to be carried on an oxen cart. King David stopped immediately. He looked up in the books, the, the, the rubrics, and he said, get that ark and put it over there. We got to reconsider how to go forward. Liturgical abuse, in other words, folks, even when done under the guise of trying to help, closes heaven's doors. Number five this is the last one. I'm just looking at these incidences in the Exodus spirituality. It's plain. We've got to start working at this a little harder, taking it more seriously. Returning to the desert, Moses was instructed by God to strike the rock in the desert to refresh God's chosen people. Later, Moses was told he need only speak to the rock and it would produce the same refreshment. But Moses, angered by the people's hardness of heart, struck the rock more than once to force it to produce. He was only supposed to speak and he struck it and then he struck it again. He was punished for this. He could not enter the promised land for doing this. Again, today, seemingly under a spell of madness, many are striking the rock again and again to force God to do things our way. For example, somewhat divorced and remarried and even other perverse unions to be accepted and legalized in the church due to the hardness of modern man's heart. Have pity on these people, we're told. They want these violations of God's law to be allowed. Even some want it applauded. But they will only be punished. They will not be allowed to enter the promised land. Christ is the rock that does not change. He cannot be struck again. There are no new sacraments. And the commandments are written in stone. Bedrock stone of the world. They're not going to change. These are given by heaven. And heaven hasn't told us to change them. Now to make our way to heaven, to take possession of that choir stall left vacant by the fallen angels, we need a spirituality that is heavenly. It is from heaven, heaven-based, heaven-sent. And we have one. This is the beauty of being Catholic. We have the whole spirituality. And it works. Let's embrace it as heaven has revealed it to us. Not what we want it to be or as the world would like it to be. Although we could talk on many things here, such as the sacraments or how the saints meditated, how they prayed. I would like to focus on three things. The priesthood, intercession. How are we to intercede for our fellow man? And music. Music. All of these are present in the Exodus spirituality and are under attack or misapplied in our times. Now, to begin with, the priesthood is what makes connections with heaven possible. Only after being baptized is the soul empowered with sacramental character, a priestly power that enables the same soul to go to the altar to enjoy its connection with heaven and offer its sacrifices in union with its majesty. But that is the common priesthood. All the baptized share, and it is for themselves. As was just indicated with Moses, there's no getting to the promised land without a visible external, that is, a ministerial priesthood, specially ordained and set aside for the helping the baptized get to heaven. The first is for the individual, the latter is for others. The priests, specially set aside to serve God and man, were among the priests holding the Ark of the Covenant that stopped the flooding Jordan so that all could pass over the river dry shod. These were the priests leading the processions around Jericho. They sounded the horns that brought the walls of the city down. Much later, it was the priestly family of the Maccabees that saved the Jews from the final destruction in the Antichrist-like times at the closing of the old law. 
when the Greeks and those in that area tried to destroy the temple and all things of the Exodus spirituality once and for all. We have this priest, first and foremost in his majesty, Christ Jesus. He is our high priest, sacrificing himself in the Last Supper and in the upper room and then on the cross the next day as both priest and victim. Well, as St. Paul says, brethren, Christ being come a high priest of the good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, heaven, not made with hands that is not of his creation, neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood, entered once into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption. His majesty, Jesus Christ, is the eternal priest. He himself is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He gives a share of his priesthood. This is a tremendous gift to the world. He gives a share of his priesthood to all the baptized. But only certain men receive a share in his external and visible priesthood. The ministerial priesthood that can give us the bread of angels, the pledge of eternal life, the bread that comes down from heaven. And this is a great privilege and gift of heaven to this earth. And this is what the priest does for us. Thus, St. John Fisher tells us this. The fathers taught the priesthood is the noblest of all dignities entrusted to man. The priesthood is the noblest of all dignities entrusted to man. In our times, the devil is working at cashing in his chips, trying to win the great gamble he made with God to destroy the church in a new hundred years war. He's working hard to cash in his chips. He appears that his army is strategically located. He has scandals to uncover. He is having some success with even cardinals being defrocked and laicized and imprisoned. Nowadays, sad to say, just hearing the title Pope, it seems we no longer have a good thought or a warm feeling in our hearts. But the fact of the matter is this. The visible and external ministerial priesthood is essential, absolutely indispensable part of our Exodus spirituality if we're going to make the exodus. And to be united to the Pope is indispensable. Thus, Pope Boniface VIII and Unum Sanctum concludes, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Can't get around that one. That is a dogma of the faith. The fact of the matter is, we need the Pope and we need the priest united to him to open up the gates of heaven in the Mass for many reasons. Among them, the forgiveness of sins. The successor of Peter holds the keys of heaven and the priest sharing in these keys offers the Mass. Does it not say in the form of the second consecration that the blood is for the forgiveness of sins? The priest, having consecrated at the altar, can now go to the baptismal font or to the confessional and pour out this very same blood upon your souls to remove blockages to heaven above. The faithful soul, therefore, ought to be very leery. Listen to my words. The faithful soul ought to be very leery about criticizing any priest. It is like committing spiritual suicide. We attack the very foundations of our spirituality when we attack him. I often wonder at some of the self-appointed critics of our time who make themselves famous by filming and openly belittling prelates of the church. And I don't care if they're wrong or not. Who gave you the authority to attack and belittle and mock a cardinal of the church? When he's defrocked, then you can reveal. You can do those things. I warn you, folks, watch out what you're looking at or what you're reading. It will be attacking your faith. Very dangerous. Personally, I wonder 
if they will have a priest at their deathbed. I wonder if they will have the keys unlock the gates of heaven. Heaven is not mocked. Thus, St. John Fisher says, He who honors the bishop will be honored by God, but he who dishonors him will be denied honored by God. He didn't qualify if the bishop's good and holy. St. John Fisher goes on to say, I conceive of no worse evil than that Christians should foster ill will towards their priests. Let me repeat that. I can conceive no worse evil than that Christians should foster ill will towards their priests. Oh, what dangerous times these are where this is in the air. It's the click on the Internet. People are cashing in their money on this regularly. Attack, attack, attack. Belittle, belittle, belittle. Who is their master? Not surprisingly, some feel tempted to go east. I've worked with a couple of people that wanted to go east. When I say east, I mean Eastern Orthodox, where they can get away from Rome altogether. Not heaven. Not heaven. In 1531, Our Lady came from heaven to Mexico and insisted over and over again that Juan Diego go to the bishop and have a chapel built there. The bishop resisted. She didn't say, Juan Diego... We don't need him. You build the chapel yourself. She says, you go back to that bishop. In 1858, Our Lady came again to St. Bernadette and Lourdes, and she said to her, go tell the priest over and over. Go tell the priest to have a chapel built here and have processions. Exodus spirituality. In 1929, with the Fatima apparitions recently officially approved, His Majesty told Sister Lucia, now was the time for the Holy Father to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so that the errors of Russia might be halted. What is the primary heir of Russia from which all the rest flow? It's her schism from Rome. It's the disobedience to Pope Boniface VIII and his teaching. Over and over again, our Lord and His Mother direct their faithful children to go to the priest, go to the bishop, go to the Holy Father. Heaven has spoken. Case is closed. What is more, in heaven we find that there is indeed a hierarchy. And not surprisingly, there's another one here on earth that mirrors it. There's choirs of angels in a hierarchy. We have those choirs of angels here on earth in the hierarchy of the church. In a word, there is order in heaven, and so should there be here on earth. Thus, it's called the hierarchy, which means literally sacred ordering. Holy ordering. And this order comes through the sacrament of holy order. It is through the sacrament that God brings order to the world. Not surprisingly, the devil will try to use these very same priests for disorder. Thus, the confusion and the test of our faith at this time. Judas was a bishop. There's been Judases ever since. But make no mistake. Heaven will always work through the hierarchy it has established. It is the same church, the church triumphant in heaven and the church militant on earth. They are the same. To attack one is to attack the other. To preserve our heavenly ascent, our exodus out of this world, it is highly advisable not to join in the attacks on the priesthood. We are being punished, folks. Let's endure the punishment and seek to bring about good and holy priests. And now we need to figure out what we can do about it instead of getting on some YouTube channel, some blog, and attack, attack, attack. What can we really do? Let's go to the next subject today. Heaven has given us means we don't take them up. This is the problem. The presence of the priesthood on earth brings us to the next point of our heavenly spirituality, namely that of intercession. God has shown us in his saints how to pray effectively throughout time. Here's an example. 1930s. A railway worker lay at death's door in the Padua Hospital in Italy. 
For more than 40 years, he had not approached the sacraments, and he would not hear of it now. The sisters sent for Father Leopoldo. He died in 1942, and he's now canonized. But the priest was rudely repulsed. He did not lose heart, but with faith that procures miracles, he prayed and made others pray to Our Lady, Refuge of Sinners. Next day, the patient, the patient complained that that little friar was always before his eyes, and he asked that he be sent for again. Full of joy, Father Leopoldo came and reconciled this man to God. And this man lived for another five days, demanding that Father Leopoldo should constantly be at his side. He was saying over and over again, he is an angel, that friar. Intercession, in a nutshell, works like this. First, the faithful servant of heaven becomes aware of something that needs intercession. Abraham was told of the evil of Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses was told of the people sinning down below. We become aware. This cardinal's not so good. This pope's not so good. This bishop or this priest is not so good. We learn. What are you going to do about it? Blog. Tell everybody else. Spread it about how bad they are. Second of all, they then take this information and turn it around. The saints, this is what they do. They then take this information and turn it around to ask God to have mercy. To change hearts and rescue fallen man from his justly deserved punishment. So in other words, they turn to God. They turn to Our Lady. Number three, here's the key. This is the part people oftentimes aren't anxious to hear about. To make the prayer effective... They use their bodies. This is what real intercessors do. They make sacrifices and offerings. St. Therese, a little flower, she learned about Pranzini. He was a murderer. He had committed three murders and was known to be rebellious. And she offered all her prayers and sacrifices for a month of suffering to gain the soul of this killer. And he converted Atheists would come to St. John Vianney, the curie of ours. Others would test him. Some came to mock him. Nearly all of them left to a man thumping their breasts well on their way to deep conversion. To make this possible, he would go without sleep. He would beat himself, even drawing blood at times. He would starve himself and eat potatoes. That's all he ate and endured terrible trials of the devil's wily ways. He used his body And it worked. When God and Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, they came to the mountain of God. Moses then ascended the mountain where he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. He wants to do this sort of thing a number of times. What was he doing up there? Interceding with God on behalf of the people after becoming aware of their sins, saving them from utter ruin each time. Thus, as Moses shows us, intercessors often use their body as an effective instrument to make intercession before God. This is because His Majesty lives to make intercession for us in heaven. How does He do it? He uses His five glorious wounds on His body. That's how He does it. He pleads with the Father. Remember these Just as Moses had done before on the mountain with his fasting and vigils, so now Christ fulfills perfectly in heaven itself. Our Lord uses his body to make intercession, and so should we, by fastings, abstinences, and vigils. Now, when saints pray for us in heaven, they only know about our prayers or troubles because they're looking at God in the center of heaven, face to face. And through God, when he chooses to reveal it, He shows them our plight. He lets them hear our prayers. We pray to a saint. God shows the saint our pleas. The saint then asks God to answer the prayer in a way most fitting to us, tapping into the treasures of merits earned by the suffering of the saints through their bodies. God responds. This is the same model we just presented above. It is the heavenly model. This is how true intercession works. Although God may not often reveal things to us through angels, He does, though, through events and our fellow men. Are we listening? Why did we hear something about this problem? 
so I can tell everybody else? No. Why did I learn about this person's sinful behavior? I didn't want to know that. I know it now. I'm going to go tell everybody else. What am I going to do with this information? Why will I know this? Instead of telling everyone else and adding to the sin, we ought rather to turn to God in prayer as Moses and the saints did. This is why we have cloistered monasteries. We can write them and tell them about it. Notice they don't tell everybody else. Listen to Our Lady of Good Success speak about cloistered monasteries. She said, Woe to the world should it lack monasteries and convents. Men do not comprehend their importance. For if they understood, they would do all in their power to multiply them, because in them can be found the remedy for all physical and moral evils. No one on the face of the earth is aware whence comes the salvation of souls, the conversion of great sinners, the end of great scourges, the fertility of the land, the end of pestilence and wars, and the harmony between nations. All this is due to the prayers that rise up from monasteries and convents. What are they doing in there? They're playing heaven. And heaven listens. Now, Elizabeth Lesseur is another example. She was married to Felix, an atheist doctor, French, fallen away Catholic, I believe. She purchased her husband's soul through her long bout of cancer. Felix Lesseur going to the Grotto of Lourdes to write a book against it because it was causing such a stir in France with so many conversions. He went to Lourdes and he came out with the faith. Her prayers worked. He soon became a Dominican priest. She used her body, cancer ridden. Do we want to be good intercessors? We must be willing to use our bodies through fasting, vigils and other penances, genuflections and kneelings through our ailments and illnesses. Let's not pamper our bodies, but use them to glorify God and to convert souls. Now this brings up another important point of our Exodus spirituality aimed at participation here and now in the heavenly life of the promised land. How can we most effectively pray our intercession? How are we going to do this? The Holy Mass and the Holy Ark of the Covenant, the Blessed Mother. Here's another one of these stories. At first light on the 6th of April, 1935, Signor Amerigo, living in a suburb of Padua, came into the city in search of a doctor for his wife. She should have given birth two days before, but now a natural birth seemed impossible. The wife's agony was terrible, and it seemed she must die. Her husband rushed off to find help, but at that early hour, he didn't know where to apply. No one was awake, finding himself basically completely filled with, ah, what do I do? He found himself outside the Capuchin church. He remembered Father Leopoldo and went in to find him as he was wont in the confessional. Father Leopoldo could see into your soul like Padre Pio. Father Leopoldo was already in the confessional when he had heard the story, remained a moment in thought as he often did. And then he said, have you any faith? Yes, Father. Good. Then go at once to the Basilica of St. Anthony and hear Mass at the tomb. Then go home and see how things are. Then come back and tell me. Father, i would gladly go and hear Mass later. But right now I must go and find a doctor for my wife. She's dying, Father. I told you to go and hear Mass at once. Moved by some unknown force, an angel, maybe grace, he obeyed. Then he rushed back home to find his wife had given birth to a beautiful child without the slightest difficulty. The birth took place, they reckon, just as he was leaving the basilica after hearing Mass. When the delighted father duly reported back to Father Leopoldo, the latter smiled, didn't I tell you to have faith in the Holy Mass? It is essential to understand that the Holy Mass opens the doors to heavenly courtroom where we can plead our case. St. Leopoldo said this, When I say Mass, my thoughts are all for those who have consulted me. Every priest should imitate this. When I say Mass, my thoughts are for all those who have consulted me. At the culmination of the sacred mysteries, I fold them all in my heart, and I know that my prayers will be answered because what I ask for is nothing 
compared to what I offer. What I ask for is nothing in compared to what I offer. As faithful Catholics, we know that the devil cannot do anything without God's permission. And God often gives permission. This is the scary part. He gives permission to the devil based upon the sins and the abuses being perpetrated on the world. The more man sins, the more permission the devil receives to harass man, tempt him, and influence him to sin more. An example of this is found in the life of St. Anthony of Padua. When a novice stole the saint's commentary on the sacred scriptures, the saint prayed that it might be found and recovered. The devil then appeared, acting as a sort of policeman for God, receiving permission to harass the poor sinner, scaring him to death, who was taking flight. Frightened out of his wits, he quickly returned the manuscript. And this is why St. Anthony is none other than the patron of lost objects. There are many high-level sins and abuses in our times that enable the devil to gain more and more power and to attack the church and overcome the saints. The main point we need to consider is how the devil and men working for him always require permission. This is an essential point for God's intercessors. Devil requires God's permission before doing anything abusive in this world. In order for his passion to begin, our Lord had to give his permission. Remember? And this is seen in what our Lord said to Judas, his betrayer. He says, what you are about to do, do quickly. I give you my permission. Once a saintly soul was instructed by his spiritual director to spit at an apparition of Our Lady that was suspected to be the devil. When the lady came, he tried to obey, but all his saliva glands dried up. Permission denied. God would not allow it. When St. Bernadette tried to make the sign of the cross before Our Lady, her arm went limp. Unable to make the sacred sign until Our Lady initiated it and taught her how to do it properly. She had to have permission. And when Julian the apostate tried to rebuild the Hebrew temple in Jerusalem, fire came out of the earth and destroyed the workers and all their efforts. It was not permitted. According to some recent biographies of Stalin, the man of steel, he was in the process of initiating a new world war, this time using nuclear weapons. He always began such efforts with a purge of his own government. Soon after the purge started, he was found lying on the floor, paralyzed from a stroke. He died shortly thereafter, permission denied. Clearly, all that has been done in this world must have God's permission. End of story. Not even a hair of our head can fall without him saying, okay. Now this means the more we sin and abuse God's established order, go against nature the way he made things, the more easily permissions are granted to the devil and evil men to do yet more and more mischief. The permissions available at this time seem to be so broad that we often say the devil is unleashed. He has little holding him back. He seemingly is free to do what he wants. Hell, as it were, has been raised to the surface of the earth. The 19th century Carmelite mystic, Blessed Francis Palau, he writes, As there is no greater good in the world than the true faith and the Catholic religion, neither can there be a more cruel, more terrible, more terrifying affliction for the world than that the Catholic Church be handed over to the devils and to wicked groups so that in punishment for our sins they attempt to root out the tree of religion. This is what's happening. What can we do? Listen to Palau. This is what he says. To weep bitterly for the deep wounds of the church would be a false resignation to conform ourselves to the permissive will of God. Just can't sit back and weep bitterly. Can't go hide in some hole. What are you going to do about it? Be a prepper and run away? Be a survivalist? I'll hold out by myself and my guns and my food supply. Is that what it's all about? No, he says this. God himself wants us to dispute this battle. 
with courage, with confidence and decision, with determination, happy, a happy, a thousand times happy, the soul that struggles properly in this battle. Fortunate is the one who is so skillful and fights with such strength so as to gain the victory. How are we going to do this? How are we going to gain the victory? What can we do to struggle? Seems that we are up against the seven-headed beasts in the apocalypse, chapter 13. We may use all our strength to knock out one or even two heads of this beast, only to see them come back while we try to get the other ones off. Blessed Francis Plough makes a keen insight, keen observation, that instead of warring with the beast on his level, we go straight to God and have the permissions withdrawn. We do this best at the Holy Mass by satisfying God's justice with the sacrifice of our Lord and our King on Calvary. What we ask is nothing compared to what we're offering. With the spotless sacrifice of the Mass that is pleasing to God, we can accomplish all things. In a couple of his works, Palau describes some amazing courtroom scenes where the devil makes his case before God that he has a right to further attack the church and the world because of the sins of man. Palau then explains that it is most especially the priest vested for the Holy Mass and offering the sacrifice of Christ, who is equipped, who is like unto God. He is dressed by Michael in the Palau's works. What is Michael's name? Who is like unto God? And Michael comes and dresses him so he is, as it were, like unto God. Wow. Thank God we have the priest. He's equipped to combat the devil in court and win the case. How important it is for the priest to know where he is and what he's doing at the Holy Mass. Every one of Christ's faithful, though, can assist the priest in the Holy Mass in having the permissions of the devil and his evil men overruled and overwritten by the precious blood of Christ. We may not be able to have all the permissions revoked due to God's mysterious plan. But the good we can do in such a struggle may only be known on the last day in the gentle judgment. But surely the devil's plans have already been frustrated time and time again from such efforts of saintly souls. Oh, what an active participation in the Holy Mass can exceed such a struggle of a holy soul with God. All this active participation that's bandied about today. I dare anyone to say there's a higher level of active participation than entering into the courtroom of God through the Mass and struggling with God to have the permissions of the devil removed from some situation in the world. Let us then pray to have the permissions removed from the devils and the various evil stewards that are attacking our beloved church, even from within and from without. God will listen. The devil will not be able to do all he has planned. The Stalins, the apostate Julians, the infiltrators will fail miserably. The Judases, the mass is the entryway to the heavens, mysterious courtroom. Let us not fail. Let us not fall into fear and bondage, but rather engage in the struggle as adopted sons who cry out, Abba, Father. Now, one last point I'd like to leave to you today is this, and that is of music. There is indeed music in heaven. Voices as well as harps and trumpets are heard there. Canticles and hymns are composed and sung there to give God glory. St. Philip Neri says, let us think if we only got to heaven What a sweet and easy thing it will be there to be always saying with the angels and the saints, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. His Majesty sang a hymn before going out into the Mount of Olives to suffer. Johann Sebastian Bach said, The end of all music should be the glory of God and the refreshment of the human spirit. Just as music is a part of the heavenly life, so too is it a part of our earthly sojourn. Music touches a spot in the soul of man that can arouse him to do good and incline him to do evil. Boethius said it like this, Music can both establish and destroy morality. 
For no path is more open to the soul for the formation thereof through the ears. Music. Therefore, when the rhythms and the modes have penetrated even to the soul through these organs, it cannot be doubted that they affect the soul with their own character and conform it to themselves. Like produces like. Bad music is going to produce bad characters. Good music is going to produce good characters. Is it by accident that after having been informed of the sins of the people at the foot of the mountain, music, dearly beloved, was the first thing Moses heard when coming down, and it sounded chaotic. It sounded warlike. Remember, Joshua said, there's a war going on down there. And Moses said, no war. That is music. The pagans often use music as a sign for all to bow down in worshiping their false gods. Has this really changed, I wonder? So many of the rock stars are involved in Satanism, and they describe the satanic help they get in playing their instruments. It was in their resisting pagan music that led the three young companions of Daniel to be cast into the fiery furnace. Music is used to charm snakes. Henry David Thoreau said, Music destroyed Greece and Rome, and it will destroy England and America. Vladimir Lenin said, One quick way to destroy a society is through its music. Frederick Nietzsche, who went insane in an asylum, yelling and screaming, he said, If African sensibility, namely voodoo, could be introduced into Western music, it would destroy Christian civilization. Hello, it has and it is. We hear it on our street every day. Voodoo. Ordered music however, has the potential to lift the mind and the heart of man. Like produces like. If you want to listen to voodoo music, you'll become satanic in your attitude. You want to listen to ordered music that is heavenly bent and aimed, you're going to become heavenly. Have you ever heard of the Mozart effect? It is proven to be true that if you let children listen to music when they're in the womb and you teach them as soon as able the piano and everything else, they start to become very highly ordered in their minds, able to remember lots of stuff. It's been proven true by many experiments, experiments on rats and animals and plants. In Gregorian chant, there are two choirs. One represents the father, and one represents the son. As they chant back and forth, just as the angels did in the vision of of the prophet Isaiah's chapter 6, the spiration of the Holy Ghost is symbolized. It's Trinitarian. Hearts are elevated and bonded in this exercise. Classical music came from Gregorian modes, being reduced from its multiple modes to major and minor keys. For many, the most enthralling classical pieces are the concertos where there's a clear dialogue going on in the orchestra between the orchestra and a certain players, a violin, a piano, an oboe. Seems to me this is, in fact, an echo of Gregorian chant and why we like it. But let's face facts. Most of our world is enraptured with bad music in our times. It's inescapable. You go to the store, ah! Everywhere you look and hear, it's here, ah! Music that appeals to the baser part of man. Music that is syncopated and built around a passionate beat. This music, all of it, no matter what the lyrics say, I don't care how Christian the lyrics are. That's not the point. It's the syncopation, it's the beat, it's the passionate nature of it that are not going to help us get to heaven. The music itself is used for inclining man to give way to his passions. In a word, it inclines us to turn off our minds and give way to our emotions and our bodies. It inclines us to practice for hell, not for heaven. Rebellion, drink, and drugs, and all that. Aristotle said it like this, Music directly imitates the passions or states of the soul. When one listens to music that imitates certain passion, he becomes imbued with the same passion. Like produces like. 
And if over a long time he habitually listens to music that rouses ignoble passions, his whole character will be shaped into an ignoble form. Like produces like. Please, dearly beloved, train for heaven by listening only to ordered music of old, Gregorian chants, choral and polyphonic works, as well as good classical works that have proven themselves down through time to order the mind and heart to think and act well. I think the lowest level I argue you can go is folk music. You don't, you're on the borderline there. Very dangerous. Be careful. Although silence is best, at times you have to fight fire with fire, And listen to good music to drown out the bad as much as possible. And do not hesitate to throw out all your modern music that is not pleasing to heaven's choirs. Are you serious about practicing for heaven? Go home and throw it out. Don't even think about it. Delete, delete, delete. Throw it out. Again, there are many more points of heavenly spirituality that could be discussed tonight, such as practicing the presence of God as if we were already in heaven. This is what the saints did. In this vein, we could also mention just briefly something of TV, movies, and videos. Are they not a pale imitation of the divine vision? They're a pale imitation or replacement. What a distraction they become for modern man, attempting to replace God. No thanks, I want the face-to-face vision of God. Briefly, what we've learned tonight, we have a spirituality given us by heaven. It is not something we make up or choose on our own. We embrace what has been given to us by heaven to train for the celestial abode above. Number two, the ministerial, visible, and external priesthood of Jesus is eternal. It continues in heaven. It connects us to heaven To attack it is to commit spiritual suicide. Number three, without the priesthood, the courtroom of heaven opens up to us in the Holy Mass through which we can plead our cause and remove the permissions of the devil. And finally, music has the ability to incline us to do good or evil. Like produces like. Let's be sure to listen only to good and wholesome tunes, good and wholesome music, heavenly music. Thank you for listening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We'll take for our reading this evening passage from Hebrews as well as from the Apocalypse. It was answered to Moses when he was to finish the tabernacle. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern which was shown thee on the mount. From the Apocalypse. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his testament was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings and voices and an earthquake and great hell. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. On the mountain of Sinai, God revealed to Moses the heavenly pattern for the earthly temple. The first thing he tells Moses about the law is to obey the Sabbath. But the first architectural particular God shows Moses from the pattern in heaven was the Ark of the Covenant. As we just heard from the Apocalypse, when St. John saw heaven open up, the first thing he sees is the Ark. If we are going to find heavenly rest, we need to start with this Ark. And the Ark, of course, is none other than the Lady, Our Lady. As we have heard, heaven has, among other things, the priesthood. The priesthood does not die. It's eternal. It continues. Heaven also cares about the truth. We've talked about that. And other things like clothing, music. And now we see heaven has architecture. And it's beautiful architecture. Proportional, light-filled, and complete. 
We are told by St. John how everything, as it were, is covered with gold and jewels, both of which, by the way, are rightly captured in the wedding ring. The man gives his bride on earth. Heaven is made of gold as one of its base metals, and I think it's even transparent gold. It shines with so much light. Transparent gold is gold, one of the base metals. So gold represents charity. That's why God chose it. The sea of love, which is what bonds together the celestial abode. So the wedding band, the gold is charity, a bond of perfection. The celestial jewels seen there in heaven can be summed up by the diamond. The most unbreakable and light-filled stone we have. All other stones break on the diamond. All light shines through it, white and clear. This jewel represents the unbreakable bond between the human and divine nature of His Majesty Jesus Christ. It is the indissoluble bond of marriage between God and man. Thus, every true marriage symbolizes this in its indissolubility. What God has joined together, man must not separate. Heaven, once attained, is forever. The bond between the saints and God is indissoluble and everlasting. They can never sin or turn away from God. They possess Him and He possesses them. Heaven has architecture and it's beautiful. We attempt to imitate it here on earth, but there are those gargoyles. Once again, to remind us that this will never do. True, but the golden ceiling of St. John Lateran in Rome makes one look up and makes one wonder. Often the ceilings of beautiful churches are intricate, containing stars and images of saints. The cathedrals in Europe, and some of them like the one in Siena, the one in Westminster, that's in London, England, are built with alternating layers of colored stone. Why? This gives them a sort of striped look. It's kind of strange looking when you first see it. It is saying this is the ladder up which you can climb to heaven. Come and ascend. One might easily note how modern churches, sad to say, do not make us look up. Sadly, they are saying no need to look up. No worry about practicing for heaven in this life. Yet in the churches of old, the priest and the people faced his majesty in the crucifix or some beautiful image or his mother or some saint. Something of heaven is the object. Now, sad to say, most face the people. No more looking up, no more climbing. We face each other. Man has become, as it were, God. Humanism reigns. But in a word, traditionally, the church, even in her hierarchy, pays attention to heaven and wants us to be thinking about heaven all the time. I hope you feel that when you come into this church. Your heart is lifted up. In a way, Christ is our architecture. Christ is Alpha, as the Alpha is the foundation stone. Christ as Omega is the capstone. We are to be the living stones that he fits into place, having been proven worthy to take our place in the heavenly Jerusalem as through a furnace purifying the gold. Thus, we have saints who are canonized. Notice we do not worry about naming those in hell. They are not worth much of our time, except as examples of what not to do. Thus, the church only has a process for canonizing saints, people who are in heaven, not of defining who is reprobate. So we look up, not down. Let's consider then one important architectural feature of heaven as it has been revealed to us. Then we can consider one of the contents of heaven architecturally, which is the ark, as it has been revealed to us in the form of a heavenly icon. You know the icon. It is Our Lady of Guadalupe. 
a pattern to know, to love, and be imitated. In the gospel, his majesty, our blessed Lord, tells us what the kingdom of heaven is like. A mustard seed that becomes like a great tree. A little leaven that expands the whole loaf. In other places of the gospel, using parables, our Lord describes the kingdom of heaven in a number of other ways. For example, the parable of the cockle and the wheat. When we read that parable, it says the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were asleep, he, his enemy came and oversowed cockle among the wheat. And the parable ends like this. Gather up first the cockle and bind it into bundles to burn. But the wheat gather ye, and here's the key, into my barns. Gather the wheat into my barns. The other stuff just cast out and be burned. In another place, we hear this. The kingdom of heaven is like to a net cast into the sea, which when filled, they drew out and sitting by the shore, they chose out the good into the vessels, but the bad they cast forth. Now, notice something important from these two parables. Those that are saved, the wheat and the good fish, are placed in containers. That is, vessels and barns. Now, using the via negativa, notice how those who are not saved are cast aside or they're burned. They're sent to the bottomless pit of hell. Notice the lack of containment in the word bottomless. Recall the description of hell given by the Fatima children, 1917. It says this, Our Lady showed us a great sea of fire, which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze. And here's the key. Floating about in the conflagration, now raised up into the air, now falling back on every side like sparks in a huge fire without weight or equilibrium, amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. Don't you see? No sense of containment. Floating about. No equilibrium. In the Apocalypse, the last book of the sacred scriptures, we have yet another description of the kingdom of heaven as the city of God. And he took me up in spirit to a great and high mountain. He showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And it had a great wall, great and high, having 12 gates. Heaven is a city and it has walls. Heaven has architecture. The saved are contained. They are possessed by God. They're put into vessels, barns, into a walled city where God is their light. Since heaven is a city with walls and the saved, according to the parables, are somehow preserved in vessels or barns, then to practice for heaven, we should somehow want to be inside a safe place. To preserve what is precious, what is good, what is orderly. Such walls are barriers to vice and evil. They enable us to live a virtuous life. Ultimately, the safe place is truly the mystical city of God, the mystical body of God, the mystical body of Christ, the church, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the bark of St. Peter. But it is also under the wings of the angel in the Ark of the Covenant, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Thus, total consecration will help this reality remain, this containment. May we never depart from her walls. Death first. And I use her in the sense of the church and the Blessed Mother. Now that means these walls are first and foremost spiritual fences. Such things as being in a state of grace. That's a fence. Prayer, that's a fence. Rosary, receiving the sacraments, as well as things we have covered in this mission, like modest clothing, celibate priesthood, virginal religious, in habit. Indissoluble marriage is a fence, as well as things like the index of forbidden books, Latin in the liturgy, or Latin liturgy period, Altar rails, silence, proper speech, we talked about that, temperance in eating and drinking, and many more scholastic philosophy and theology come to mind. 
These acts, these act as barriers, fences, walls to the secular world around us, keeping us safe, preserving us from harm. We cannot just do what we want. We must work within boundaries if we hope to be possessed by God in the heavenly city. And here they are. These are the boundaries. All those things I mentioned. In fact, throughout the sacred scriptures, over and over again, God describes his chosen ones as being protected by fences, hedges, and walls. For example, his vineyard is always described in the gospel, in the Psalms, and in Isaiah, the prophet, as having a hedge around about it. Nay, even individual faithful souls are described as being fenced in. From the book of Job, we hear this. Now, on a certain day when the sons of God came to stand before the Lord, Satan also was present among them. And the Lord said to him, Whence comest thou? And he answered and said, I have gone round about the earth and walked through it. And the Lord said to him, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? A simple and upright man, fearing God and avoiding evil. And Satan answered and said, Doth Job fear God in vain? Hath not thou made a fence for him and his house and all his substance round about? Bless the works of his hands and his possessions and hath increased on the earth. The message is plain. The fences, walls, hedges erected by God protect us from evil and the evil one. But there needs to be physical walls too. Why? To preserve order as much as possible within some region. Think about it. It was walls of Constantinople that kept the Muslim armies at bay for centuries until 1453. The fate of Christian Europe, Christendom, was time and time again determined at the walls of places like Belgrade, Vienna, and the walled cities and forts of Malta. It was the Muslim expertise in trying to destroy these very walls that we have the commonly used word undermine. Dig it underneath and you put a bomb down there, blow it up from underneath. Lately, however, we've been told things like this. A person who only thinks about building walls, wherever they may be, and not building bridges, is not Christian. Now, wait a minute. Europe has lost the concept of protective barriers that the stone-walled cities of old represented. The very walls that kept Islam in check down through the centuries, we've lost the whole concept. Now they are basically, that is, the Muslims have no more walls to hold them back. And it may not be long before the Quran and Sharia law take over in many places. They're already silencing many a bell in Europe. It's a recipe for war, a divided city, divided nation. Fences make good neighbors. Tear down the fences, the neighbors are going to be at each other. The scripture also tells us what happens when the protective walls erected by God were removed. Listen to King David in the Psalms. Thou has broken down all his hedges. Thou has made his strength fear. All that pass by, by the way, have robbed him. He hath become a reproach to his neighbors. Wow, you get it? Protective barriers, take them away. What's going to happen? It leads to fear. It leads to poverty and it leads to reproach. In another place, King David pleads with God about his vineyard. He says, why hast thou broken down the hedge thereof? So that all they who pass by the way do pluck it. The boar out of the wood hath laid it waste. And a singular wild beast hath devoured it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see and visit this vineyard. No walls, raising of the bastions leads to the eventual destruction of the vineyard. In the Old Testament, there are several places describing the rebuilding of Jerusalem. First, after the Babylonian exile, and then during the time of the Maccabees. 
In each case, the rebuilding of the wall was essential to reestablishing the godly order that had been lost. It was among the first things that had to be done. The rebuilding of the holy city after Babylonian captivity was possible only through the help of the pagan king of Persia, Cyrus. This was covered in the book of Esdras, Ezra, and Nehemiah. These books describe how the God-fearing people were repeatedly hindered from rebuilding the wall. But nevertheless, they finally completed the project by keeping vigil. Literally sleeping in their work clothes, as well as holding a sword in one hand while they laid the stones with the other. The Holy Bible describes in all these cases how the neighboring regions, all the neighbors with all their imported peoples were angry that the walls were being rebuilt. Thus, they had to hold a sword in their hand as they put the stones down. Get back, get back. They did not want the true religion getting back its rightful place. They wanted a borderless society of sorts, without boundaries, without limits, such as the Ten Commandments demand. Again, here is our via negativa. If such people did not want it, we should. Who doesn't want the walls, you ask yourself? Then you might want walls when you start thinking about it. It's clear from all this, the devil hates protective barriers. It's the point of this sermon. He always tries to get his revolutions and revolutionaries to tear down all barriers, both spiritual and physical. He wants them to level all that is good and orderly. He wants them to raise, R-A-Z-E, to raise the bastions, the protective barriers. He wants freedom to send in his minions to strike fear into the inhabitants in order to make them sin, stop practicing virtue and despair of serving God as he has commanded us. And from all this, it is clear, walls are important because they protect and they preserve order, making it easier to practice for heaven. Since they are scriptural, since they are traditional, since they are effective, then they are supremely Christian. No wonder the Vatican City State has a wall around it. It's not easy to get in it either. You have to go through all kinds of processes to go see the Vatican Garden. Well, if people are against the wall, why not tear those down? And let's see what happens to the Vatican Gardens. Let's see what happens to security. No wonder cloistered convents have walls around them. Without these protections, we will end up swimming in a cesspool and living in fear. As the Holy Bible says, the removal of the hedges is indeed a punishment. Dearly beloved, if we want to preserve order and not live in fear, boundaries are required. If we want to protect the integrity of our spiritual life and those of our beloved ones, we need to have fences in place, such as barriers on the Internet and its uses, as what kind of books we read. These need to be screened. They need to have barriers. What kinds of recreation is embraced? Let's face facts. TV is practically, not even practically, it's definitely a Trojan horse in any home. But this truth is also holds for lower levels, as well as including physical boundaries of our homes, our city, our country. Let us then practice for heaven by living an orderly life and seeking to preserve that order for our children and our neighbors. Building walls isn't always a bad thing. It can be very good, very effective, and help us keep order. Now, once inside the walls, we find why they were erected, to protect what is beautiful. St. Thomas Aquinas says of beauty, as may be gathered from the words of Dionysius, beauty or comeliness results from the concurrence of clarity and due proportion. 
For he states that God is said to be beautiful as being the cause of the harmony and clarity of the universe. Let us now move to the beautiful icon that heaven has given us and see truly how it is a source of harmony and clarity for the whole universe. When King David wanted to build the temple, he consulted the prophet Nathan. If you recall the story, Nathan tried to prophesy without God's willing it. It was such a good thing to build a temple. What other answer could there be other than, yes, go ahead, King David. So he told David to move forward, pull the trigger on building this temple as he desired. God came to him later that night to Nathan and corrected him and sent him back to David to give him a true prophecy that spoke of a temple that would not be destroyed, not a physical temple. And David was not going to be allowed to build it anyway. The Lord foretelleth to thee, he said, that the Lord will make thee a house. What is this house? This house is Our Lady. She is the temple of God, the city of God, the sanctuary of the Holy Ghost. He whom the world cannot contain came and dwelt in her womb. She is the house of gold in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, she came to us to remind us of this in December in 1531. Leaving her beautiful countenance upon the tilma of Juan Diego, in this heavenly icon, Provided by heaven. This is a heavenly icon. It's miraculous. Has a comprehensive message for our time. It is truly the ark because inside is found the New Testament. The child Jesus is in her womb. So she's showing that she is the ark. In me is the New Testament. And all that it means to be the ark of old is fulfilled in me. Here, pictured on the tilma, is the promised sinless house of God that sinful David could not make. A little history. The visions took place as Europe was in the throes of the Protestant Revolution, as well as the Renaissance, a rediscovery of pagan texts of Rome and Greece, which led in part to modern science. At this time, Copernicus revived the long-dead Greek theory of heliocentrism, that the earth revolved around the sun, rejected by the fathers and the doctors universally. At the time, it was held that the earth occupied the center. This was the conviction of all the fathers and the doctors before, too. And they were aware of the theory of heliocentrism. As a result, this was the early beginnings of humanism and enlightenment, which really ended up being in darkenment. Enlightenment in the sense that man was following his own reason, more than faith. Reason, science, asserting itself over faith. False science, one might put in there. Pseudoscience, unproved science. Theories that have no basis. And we're still dealing with this enlightenment today. It is behind all that is troubling our world. And that is why we're in a sort of death struggle at this moment. It is coming to an end. The writing is on the wall, or should I say... On the tilma. Also of historical note, in 1531, the Muslims were rising up and making great headway in the East, threatening Europe itself. At this critical time, Our Lady came to give us a message to dispel the confusion and darkness caused by these things and bring the faithful back to the obedience of the faith. And since the Enlightenment is still very much with us in modernity, it's all matured now in modernism, Neo-modernism. This message is still very relevant. Here then are some of the major points we can consider. And these are, as it were, fences that keep us within God's beautiful architecture. Muslims and Protestants, it's no secret, are essentially iconoclasts. They destroy images and symbols throughout Europe in their own day, and they continue to do so. They destroy crucifixes, statues, altars, relics, even whole monasteries, and so on. They are iconoclasts. What does heaven do? Heaven gives us a heavenly icon of Our Lady with our Lord in her womb and an angel supporting her. Heaven gives us an image. 
proving they're wrong. Let us be sure to have images, crucifixes, pictures of Our Lady in prominent places in our homes. Not be afraid. Please do not be afraid to be Catholic. This is good practice. And heaven wants it. Look at this beautiful image I've given you. I want you to have images. That's what heaven is saying. The Protestants and many others, like the scientists of the day, held that they did not need to heed anyone in authority. They were themselves authorities. Shunning and even spurning the Pope and the magisterium of the church, they could interpret the scriptures as they pleased and do what they wanted. When Our Lady came, she asked for a chapel to be built on Tepeyac outside of Mexico City. We mentioned this last night. She sent the poor man Juan Diego to the local bishop to accomplish this task. The bishop resisted. Instead of saying, who needs the bishop? Build it yourself, Juan Diego. She worked with the local authorities without ever criticizing him. Arguably, because of his resistance, that's the bishop's resistance, she gave us her image on the tilma as proof of her request. Without his resistance, would we have had the image? God works through the authorities he has established on earth. Authority has only one author upon which that word is based. Authority, author, and it is God. Go against the authority, you're going against God. Romans chapter 13. The Protestants cast aside all sacramentals, and they claimed that they were superstition. In the image, we find Our Lady wearing a sacramental, a little cross around her neck. We should be wearing the brown scapular. We should be wearing the miraculous medal. We should be praying the rosary, a sacramental. We should be using them, sacramentals. Heaven wants it. Heaven wills it. It is practicing for heaven. It is a fence that's hard to get through. The Protestants claim that they can interpret Scripture without the church, and one of their favorite books is that of the Apocalypse. Why? Sometimes when I'm driving down the road, I'll click on the radio, very rare for me, and I'll find some station that's religious. You find the Protestant station, usually someone's talking up a storm. Inevitably, they're always talking about the book of the Apocalypse. Why? Because it's easy to talk about a future reality rather than the present or the past. A future reality that you think is going to happen when in fact there's a lot happening right now and it has happened and you refuse to look at it. Here in this image, we have a near perfect fulfillment of the 12th chapter of the Apocalypse. In short, the image shows her as the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. All this says Our Lady is the woman, and she is essential in gaining victory over Satan, the dragon. She is the fence we're going to need. In the 16th century, the Muslims were rising up while the West was in disarray. They came back to Rome in 1571 on the ocean, but were checked and defeated in the Battle of Lepanto on October 7th which later became the Feast of the Rosary. One of the flagships had the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on the main mast. She is standing on the symbol of Islam, a crescent moon. She asked to be called Guadalupe. The shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Spain was named after the river Guadalupe, which is Arabic for river of the wolf, which preceded the apparitions. The Muslims who occupied Spain for almost 800 years named that river. The message is clear. Our Lady will conquer Islam. Why are people afraid of Islam? Why is Islam rising up? Because devotion to Our Lady has waned. Because our faith has waned and we're being punished. If we're going to win, we're going to need this fence. We're going to need this wall, and they can never undermine this wall if we stay behind it. The Enlightenment has led to the poo-pooing or demythologizing of miracles. Even to this day, there's a lack of belief in miracles. Many try to explain away those performed by our Lord in the Scriptures. 
In Mexico City in the middle of the winter, Our Lady miraculously provided Castilian roses for the Spanish bishop. And many more miracles were worked through the Telma, which in itself the greatest of the miracles. True science today has basically concluded that the Tilma itself is a continuous miracle. Some examples, it has not decayed. The image is actually on top of the fabric in some way, rather than painted on the fabric. Some wicked men, Freemasons, have tried to destroy the Tilma at times with bombs or carrying it away, all to no avail. It was always preserved Is this not miraculous? Heaven is working here. Enlightened man, modern man, has attacked the existence of angels. You cannot place angels under a microscope. They are not scientifically observable. Yet in the Tilma, an angel holds up Our Lady. We should be praying to our angel. This is offense. St. Michael the Archangel, we should be praying to him as the leader of God's army. The Enlightenment has attacked modesty and piety. Our Lady stands in a pious position and modestly dressed, just like this statue here. Again, here's a lesson for our immodest and prideful times. We need to dress modestly at all times and not be afraid to be and look pious. The Enlightenment has given us birth control, contraception, sterilization, and abortion. Yet Our Lady shows us by her image to be open to life and that we are to be about making saints for heaven in the married life. This image has helped many women convert from the decision to have an abortion as well as to return to confession after having had one. They look at the image and they're cut to the heart and they drop on their knees and they convert. It's happened to many a woman. Thank God. The Tilma clearly presents Our Lady as worthy of honor. She is crowned queen in the image. When the Indians of Mexico saw this beautiful lady, came to them with Our Lord in her womb. They honored her and converted in incredible numbers. Something like 2,500 people a day over like eight or nine years. That makes seven million. That's a lot. Can you imagine baptizing 2,500 people a day? Here is the sign of Jonah for the prideful and rebellious Europeans at the time. They were losing the faith. They were destroying the icons throughout Europe. And here we have a simple image from heaven converting the pagan, idol-worshipping, human-sacrificing Indians of Mexico to the faith. What a marvel. And finally, the Copernican Revolution eventually led to the common belief still held today that we're not really that important after all. Remember, the Copernican principle is that this is not a special place. It's a humdrum, backwater, little dust ball in the universe that's been forgotten. Mm-hmm. No, we hold a special place in the cosmos. Einstein says all is relative, it doesn't matter. His theory is basically over. He has any truthful modern astrophysicist will have to admit. We are told that we're not the center of God's cosmological designs if they believe in God at all. Listen to Einstein's own words as he approached the end of his life. When you get close to death, you start being more plain. He said, I consider it quite possible that physics cannot be based on the field concept. That's part of his theory of relativity. In that case, nothing, listen to his words, in that case, nothing remains of my entire castle in the air, gravitation theory included, and of the rest of modern physics. He made several such statements as he grew older. Here is a man who has proposed highfalutin theories that have turned the world upside down, and now we have lots of relativism, relativity, and he's dying unsure of himself. Modern science proceeds from funeral to funeral, and it will not be long before we bury the theory of relativity too. In fact, it's probably already buried. 
They just haven't had the courage to put the obituary in the paper. Now listen to some of the most famous astronomers of our time. Stephen Hawking. He said, why should God or the laws of nature care about what happens on the third rock from the sun, which is where Copernicus has left us? Others add Darwin saying the Copernican revolution taught that it was a mistake to assume without sufficient reason that we occupy a privileged position in the universe. Darwin showed that in terms of origin, we're not privileged above other species. Our position around an ordinary star and an ordinary galaxy and an ordinary supercluster continues to look less and less special. Clearly, Copernicanism is nothing less than the foundation of modern man's view of himself. All is relative. We really don't matter. Sin, therefore, is really not that big of a deal after all. Who cares? What's the big deal? Yet, at the very moment of Copernicus's claim, Our Lady shows us something much different. Heaven is speaking. We are the apple of her eye. There are literally pictures of men in her eyes. St. Juan Diego and the bishop being among them. God is in her womb. God is in her womb. Noted by the special flower of the Aztecs that symbolizes the Lord of the universe. The creator of the universe came to this earth through one of us. We matter You get it? We matter after all. The creator of the universe came to this earth through one of us. Our lady is clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet. She's wearing a robe of stars, all fitting the constellations of that day. December 12, 1531, high power computers have proven that the stars on her mantle, on the Telma, match the sky of that day. Here is a message indeed. The place is central to our God, for we are certain, yes, we are the spiritual center. God came here, he died here. We are the spiritual center, but we are also the physical center. God does everything in layers. We know that God works sacramentally, giving outward and visible and physical signs that are spiritually true. And that means we are also physically the sinner. And science has figured it out with a cosmic microwave background and the Sloan sky survey and all kinds of stuff. The science is figuring this out. The scientists are running scared. Man is a microcosmos of the whole universe. A microcosmos. We are the center. Man is made in the image of God. The universe, both on the inside of man and that on the outside, acts like a sort of icon. And that, when read correctly, leads to God. From the current scientific data, we keep coming to the same conclusion. We are at the center. Once again, the microwave, gamma ray, radio wave, redshift observations are almost universal and that we are at the center. The enlightened scientists are worried. All the Copernican based theories are failing. Stephen Hawking says that we happen to find ourselves so near the center is uncomfortable for human modesty. Why? Uncomfortable for human modesty? I find it very comfortable, very relaxing, very peaceful. Here is a quote from one of the greatest astronomers of our times, Edwin Hubble. The Hubble Space Telescope is named after him. He was running in fear, big fear. Listen to him. Such a condition that we're at the center. Such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe. Analogous in a sense to the ancient conception of a central earth. This hypothesis cannot be disproved. But it is unwelcome and would only be accepted as a last resort in order to save the phenomena. Therefore, we disregard this possibility. The unwelcome position of a favored location, listen to his words, must be avoided at all costs. Such a favored position is intolerable, he says. Therefore, in order to restore homogeneity and to escape 
the horror of a unique position. It must be compensated by spatial curvature. There seems to be no other escape. It didn't work. The horror of a unique position. The favored position is intolerable. Why do they talk like this? What is the problem? Because if we're the center, then Christmas is real. God became man through the woman. He died on the cross on Calvary. That means I have to follow the Ten Commandments. That means the Eucharist is real. That means there is an up and there is a down. Maybe that's the scariest part of all. There's a heaven and a hell, a devil, a dragon, a spiritual war. And I've been on the wrong side the whole time. And our actions matter. The universe is an icon and the Catholic Church is the true church of God built on the rock of this earth as its very center. And this is not superstition. At the Annunciation, the angel said to Our Lady, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. We have found favor with God in and through Our Lady. He has become to us and has revealed Himself to us through her. He did it again to clarify matters in the tilma. We are the apple of His eye. Let's heed the message of this private revelation in the tilma and let it help us to live the gospel more and more in these difficult times. Help us to reestablish the fences that have been torn down, that have been raised. Let's use the sacraments, the sacramentals, the icons. Be deeply and piously devoted to Jesus living in Mary, even consecrating everything to them. Let us adhere to the authority and the authoritative teachings of the Pope and the Magisterium of the Church. Pray to the angels. Let us dress modestly and be unconditionally pro-life. These will keep us focused on the lamp shining in the dark and obedient to the faith. The enlightenment will come to an end. At least in our lives and in our surroundings, we'll put it to death. It's already in his death throes, but it's going to get rough before it's all over. Seek refuge in the devotion to Our Lady, for this is her task, to conquer the Enlightenment. Humanism gone amok. Modernism. Let us then always be children of Blessed Mary. Now as we end this mission, and I thank you for coming so faithfully, I would like to give you one last analogy that captures much of what I've tried to impart. Now consider that man born with original sin, I'm just making an analogy here, a fractal pattern maybe you could even call it. He is not complete. Man is born with original sin is sort of like an ovum or an egg cell. He is not complete. He needs the word of God implanted in him the seed to be sown that the new life of grace can begin in him without the seed he's only a tiny fraction of what god has in store for him thus the egg has only got half of the needed chromosomes it can never develop without them now what if the egg resists the seed or rejects it altogether, thinking, I've got to be me. I've got to be free to do my thing. If I let that in here, if I give way to this, I will no longer be me. I'll have to change. Go away. Leave me alone. When this happens, the man remains forever a fraction or a shadow of what he was meant to be. Unfulfilled. And like the egg, he is flushed out of this world and down into the sewer. This is the picture of a damned soul who has resisted and rejected God. Why does a soul go to hell, St. John Vianney says? Because he resisted the Holy Ghost. There it is. Even though God was constantly knocking at his door, let me in. 
I'll make you something beautiful. I'll make you more than you are. I'll give you what you're lacking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. If, however, the egg opens the door to the seed, it becomes whole and begins to develop slowly but surely into a baby in the womb of his mother. The baby is comfortable and knows vaguely the love of his mother. The child hears muffled sounds and feels the beating of her heart. The child is nourished by his mother through the umbilical cord. And various waste materials are taken from the baby by the mother as well. But after being born, it's a painful and traumatic experience for the child and the mother too. The baby receives the face-to-face -face vision of his mother and receives the joy of her love. A whole new reality is opened up to the child. Living in the womb is like living in a state of grace on earth. Living in the womb of the church, which may seem constricted at times. The umbilical cord is the sacraments. The Eucharist providing us sustenance and confession, taking away the undesirable materials. Being born is like death of the body, but a new life for the soul. If we're born prematurely, we go to purgatory to develop the rest of the way, but without merit or increase in charity. But once born, no more umbilical cord is needed. No more sacraments are required. The muffled, shadowy life of the womb of faith is replaced by clear face-to-face -face vision of God and the infinity of His goodness opens up. Nothing will be lacking. An eye has not seen, an ear has not heard what you will receive when you're born. The soul enters into the infinite, unbounded expanse of the one act of knowing and loving God which produces perfect happiness, eternal happiness. Let us then, dearly beloved, always be about responding to the graces and helps heaven gives us so that we too will be born into eternal life to claim the celestial choir stall reserved for us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming to this mission. We hope that you receive many graces and blessings as you spend your life practicing for heaven.